All right, we're back with uh, another edition of the Growth Podcast. Uh, yet another conversation that is going to enlighten us on so many aspects. We've had, I think, 11 conversations over the past few, well, two months or so. And we want to continue on that trajectory. And thank you so much, obviously, for supporting the podcast and being here with us today. And today we're going to reward you with a lot of insight and obviously a lot of growth in your personal life and also in your business life, if at all you are running a business. Our conversation today is very interesting because it focuses on something that most people who are in jobs either struggle with or contemplate a lot or others are actually doing it and doing it very well so if you're one of those people that are falling in any of these categories this podcast is for you and i'll be talking to someone obviously who's going to delve into that conversation which even though i haven't mentioned yet i really want you to look forward to it and we'll be introducing our subject of conversation in just a few minutes but for now i'm going to introduce to you my guest who is dressed very dapper uh, he's overdressed <laughs> for the event. I mean, look at me. I mean, look at me. And, and he sort of makes me look bad. You didn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you should have asked. <laughs> no, no, I think. Yeah, but you see, I always tell people, I was like, guys, when you are going for an event and they invite you, <laughs> dress in a way that represents you. Absolutely. I don't believe in what's a dress code. No, yeah. like, like when, when, when you show up, oh, that is the authentic you showing that's, up. That's it. Otherwise, yeah. you end up forcing people to buy clothes they don't even like. No, because you told I them agree with you. Is. And this is me. Either if it's a Saturday, I'll come like this. This is me. As yeah. it should be. Yeah. <laughs> okay. By the way, this is Yangeni Chandela. Uh, he is, well, an HR expert. He is an author of a book that is... To be launched absolutely uh, we'll talk about that a bit later but yeah so our focus of conversation today i didn't mention it earlier is we're focusing on side hustles okay and side hustles obviously are for people who have a main thing that's why it's called a side hustle um you've got a job you're trying to build a career but then also you have a business on the side that you're running to help complement your income or to just help you make ends meet or help you want to live a better life because at the end of the day sometimes some salaries or should i say more salaries are not yeah. enough yeah the, the, like i said last time i think i remember having a chat with you i'm yet to meet somebody that can tell me that uh, through their salary they have been able to meet all their expenses and all their needs especially being able to maintain their lifestyle and that's why uh, the, the the need or the talk of side assos needs to be discussed further so that people can understand can operate it in a more professional way which will not offend anybody and which will just uh, give results to both parties especially those that could be working okay and 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 and, and i'll like to i'll like to establish how do you identify a side hustle that works for you because for some people, um, they feel they can do anything as long as it brings in a bit of money. So depending on your profession, how do you identify that, okay, this is a side hustle that doesn't take away from my time at work? Okay, uh, we need to address a few things uh, regarding uh, side hustles. And uh, uh, one of them that we need to address is, yes, we've established that most employees, those who are working, it is sort of impossible for them to maintain a certain kind of lifestyle, even what we can term a basic lifestyle, without doing or without having an extra source of income. And I've always said that uh, employees that have an extra source of income from somewhere seemingly seem to be more stable in their jobs because they do not have to worry about small things. Yeah, But now the, the, the challenge we have is uh, we need to agree that we have a potential conflict of interest in most of these side assets. Why am I saying so? Is if you are working, uh, Suilanji, you're working for ZNBC, ZNBC uh, requires a certain number of hours from your end. So does BDO require certain hours on my end. So now, when you are establishing uh, your side asset, you need to look at the things which cannot be in conflict with your employer. And that's the the first focus so if we are looking at probably the 10 uh, most user-friendly side assos let me use that word uh, you notice that these are side assos which should not make you be unable to give your 100 percent to your current job 
that is the number one thing that we look at if i'm gonna go into a side also i should not compromise my availability to my employer because if i do so then the side also becomes a conflict to my job not only uh, should it conflict my job but again i should not be able to do something that my employer does because remember i'm trying to answer your question how do we choose a particular side also but now what i've seen a trend on the market right now is that uh, uh employer employees because they have seen that their employer is seemingly doing fine in the business which they're doing then the employee wants to venture in the same business and he calls it a side also i think <laughs> i think that is not fair on the employee because you were employed by somebody and most people have been taught to do those jobs by that particular person uh, then over time you want to call that business as a side hustle no 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 it's still a man also for your employer because he's taught you uh, i've got a practical example on this one uh, two young boys were employed by my elder brother to run uh, a printing company and you know a printing company if you are the owner you're not the one who's involved in the designing and the printing and the likes six months down the line these guys bought their own computers okay and some clients started coming direct to them instead of to the main business but on the first value of it they are advertising the business based on the employer's initials so now as much as they were doing a side hustle but if you see here there's a direct conflict of what of interest because this is the same business which your employer does so when you are selecting the side hustle we want you to do something that is con uh, contrary far from what your employer does for instance if uh, i'm in uh, auditing i'm not expected to open an auditing firm i can go and do my salon i can do uh, my barber shop because those things are are, are part from what the employer what does but now one thing that uh, we've seen that's why some employers are very uh, strict on side assos is that some side assos do require excessive hours to be present and now we all know that you're expected to have eight hours to produce uh, to a particular employer now how do you carry your eight hours with a particular employer at the same time you space some time for your side also so there is that conflict and because of the divided attention most employers are against employees to have side assets because it gets the attention that they're supposed to have at work and gets it to their business and you you know that if you have your business and you have somebody's business your heart will be where where your <laughs> business is so that's why now we need to strike uh, a balance uh, which side assets can one operate in probably this is a conversation that we're gonna have further that cannot conflict with the employer interesting and so what are what are some of the ways that like what what research should one do um for them to then begin to identify to say okay i think this side hustle is going to work for me and my employer won't have a problem with it and then also do employees always have to declare what they're doing even if it's their own private thing i, I think in most good contracts there's a clause where you have to declare uh, a conflict of interest that's very important even if the business may not be in line with the employer's business but it's always important that you declare uh, your conflicts of interest because there are potential conflicts which can arise or probably your employer may come and wish to venture in that particular business but if you are declared at the point when you are starting work you would have told them i've been in this business for five six years prior to your joining then it gives you a harper and even if the, somebody wanted to discipline you over that uh, side also so uh, the issue of now selecting a particular side also is not an easy one it's as good as somebody walking to you and ask you i've got a 20000 i've got a 50000 what business should i do i think i've seen this question uh, i've received this question I, I a, a lot <laughs> to say what particular business what should i do i call it it's a chinese code the moment you are able to break that code right meaning you are able to find an answer and you are able to generate uh, an income so now there's something that i've been sharing with people is uh, if you are deciding on what type of business to do sometimes it's important to look at what are your passions 
I remember I, I met a friend, very good. He, he's supposed to be doing some very good business. But because that is not his passion, he told me I cannot venture in it because it's conflicting with my passions. So now, in Zambia, we've got a thing where people say, no, no, your passion can't pay you. Okay? You may be passionate about something, but that thing cannot pay you. But there's a, a very uh, huge correlation with your passion and the nature of the business that you are able to do. You know that people start businesses for various reasons. And among those reasons is income generation. Okay? But other people, it could be as a result of the problem that they went through. Because this problem was so bad for them. They were trying to look for a solution. And in the process... The solution they found was able to pay them. I think we know the issue of how somebody developed cheaper uh, uh, glasses for these people with uh, eyesight problems. You remember that this guy was trying to get pairs of glasses for himself for a long time. And they were so expensive. So he thought, why can't I develop something that could be user-friendly for an average person? And in the end... It's as a result of the problem that this person had, but he ended up becoming a millionaire. So we are trying to uh, make a connection with the passion that somebody has or with the problem that somebody has to the potential of that becoming a what? A side asshole. I, I know we may talk about my book. I'll tell you. Uh, there are things like writing a book. People write books for various reasons. Others are going through some emotional things that they are going through. They just want to record those things. Yeah. Others would go in the book writing specifically for making what? Money. Money. But it is a passion which they have to write. But in the end, that passion can generate them what? An income. So you can start aside also with, uh, I believe, even your passion, just by using your passion. Now, somebody, I know somebody who's listening and saying, Mr. Chendera, what is that passion? You keep talking about uh, a passion and how can passion earn you an income? It is possible passion can earn you what? An income because if you go in the human resource, talking of human resource, employees that are very passionate in doing their job, they seem to enjoy their job because they will do it without being forced. So, if you went to do a business that you are very passionate about, even if the business may be failing, but because you are so passionate about this thing, you may end up finding a solution to that problem. Now, if you go into something that you don't have an interest in, it's very easy that you can easily leave it out. So uh, my, uh, my, 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 my first approach to choosing a side also is, I want to ask you, what are you passionate about? Because you cannot do a business which you're not passionate about. You cannot do a program, even at school. I know there are, there are, there are, there are students who have found themselves in programs which the parents chose for themselves. And we've seen they have been struggling because they're not passionate about those particular programs. The passion that, that you've mentioned, um, for most people, you find that because I am in a particular industry, uh -huh. or because I am in a particular you know, a field of work, and I do it every day, then I have a passion for it. And so my side hustle will be in relation to what I'm doing. So for example, you may be an HR guy, uh -huh. you work in an auditing firm, yeah. and because you've worked there for a long time, you begin to develop a passion for auditing. Yeah. The <laughs> next time you want to open an auditing consultancy, yeah. you know? so how then do you manage that, where you have this passion mm -hmm. that grows on you by virtue of being exposed to this Certain environment, yeah. to this working sector, how then do you manage that? Okay, 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 thanks. <coughs> that's, that's good. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, uh, so already that uh, can has potential to bring some conflict of interest because you are developing, I will not call it passion really, I will call it interest. Uh, we, we become fond of things that we do every day. For instance, you are at uh, ZNBC almost every day. So now your love for media keeps growing. I wouldn't call that much of passion. I'll call it an interest as a result of you being in that area all the time. So now, we still want to establish how one can develop a side as to that as no conflict with their day jobs. Not so. 
because this is what is important because i don't want to stand here and encourage somebody to go and do a business that is direct in conflict with the employer then we'll be killing the industries so what we want to encourage somebody is identify businesses that are far from what your employer are doing unless you feel what the employer is doing is what you are meant to be doing as well then you are supposed to go and be your own employer in that case i've met people that uh, came to join organization and they say i just want to work for three years and the reason i want to work for three years because i want to go and set up a similar business so this is for purposes of learning it is understood this person from where go has told you what they want and the business uh, the joining of that particular employer is for the purposes of what of learning and very few employers are keen to take on such people because these people have told them the honest truth which they want to do. To say, I just want to learn and go and set up my what, my business. Maybe I would like to ask you, Suilanji, if I came to you as a new joinee in your organization and I tell you, oh, I just want to work for four years and learn what you do so that I go and set up my own company. Would you hire oh, me? <laughs> <laughs> you see, uh, because why wouldn't you hire me? No, because it basically means now we are now re replicating the company. You know? I'm actually creating my potential competitor. competitor. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know that there are others who say the whole idea should be for you to empower others. <laughs> like, yeah, I get that. <laughs> but, ah, uh, no, I just feel like it's wrong. <laughs> like, Is it? I feel like I, I wouldn't be comfortable because you know our ins and outs. It's, it's like you're basically coming to spy for four years. That's it. And then you leave us. That's why we are not encouraging employees to start businesses which are very close or similar to what the employers do. There's so many businesses that you can do that are not in conflict with what the employer. Now, for instance, I've mentioned even book writing as the side also that one can do that is far from what the employer does. A barbershop. Maybe these things I'm talking about, they are so close to me. But I've met people that uh, even the issue of podcast, okay? Writing articles, these things are able to pay. It's just that the payment does not come instant. You need to be very patient. And most of the people that I've met, that one side asses, they want to plant a seed today and tomorrow they are able to have a full grown tree. Unfortunately, business does not work like that. So it's not an easy game, but we need to learn. From the perspective of the employer, how do you deal with employees that are very enterprising? Uh, because some employees always want to find something to do, opportunity to make money here and there. How do you show them that, look, you can go ahead and do this, but the work should move? Uh, I'll tell you, uh, I think uh, right now, every employer right now is struggling with that because there seem to be this wind in the country that everybody has to be doing some sort of business. But that has had a lot of effect on the productivity, okay? Yes, it is good to have enterprising employees in these organizations, but to some extent, the balance of it is not easy, okay? I was uh, attending a workshop, and one of uh, the CEOs from the bank was asked a very good question. He was asked, is it achievable to have a work-life balance, right? Is it achievable... To have a work, I think this is one of the questions that everybody yeah. keeps talking about. I liked what this gentleman said. He just said, No, it is not. You can never have what we call a work life balance. You cannot have your 100% on the employer and your 100% on your family. It is not possible. Why is it not possible? Because work demands certain hours from you. The family demands certain hours from you as well. So even when it comes to business, if an employee is so enterprising, right, the business demands time, demands effort, demands strategies to be done. So if the person is so enterprising and the work is so demanding, it is not possible to achieve this balancing to some sort. What about the last time we talked about some employees um, who have to work for organizations that do not allow them to have a side hustle whatsoever. Okay? Would you encourage people to still commit to those kinds of contracts? Yes, I know jobs are hard to find, blah, blah, blah. But you find you get into this job and they're paying you, let's say, 3,000 kwacha. Yeah. 
and they're telling you you can't do anything else. It's just this job. And you work weekends, you work Monday to Friday, sometimes you get home 8 p.m. and you can't do anything else. Now, 3,000 kwacha, let me not even break down the costs yeah. in this country of rent and transport and whatnot. And then because you want to be in a job, yeah. you find yourself committing to this job and three, four years down the line, you've got no business of your own. I, I think to be honest and to be fair, I think that is suicidal. I've often, if you go in my book, I've addressed that issue. I've said, if you're currently working and you've not been planning to have anything or nothing is running in the background, then you are committing your own death slowly. You are killing yourself slowly because we all need to know that uh, we used to have these concepts of jobs for life. A long time ago, where my father, your father would work and wait to be given a gold watch as it, uh, 25 years of service and the likes. But right now, an average employee is doing two years, three years, right? Because the modalities have changed. I think in the U.S. there is uh, what they're calling the gig economy. They lost about two million employees. They left the working environment and they went to work for themselves. This is the same thing that I'm seeing in our country. Everywhere where I've gone, Somebody is talking about, I want to do something for myself. I want to do something for myself. So I cannot see a situation to see an employer will still be adamant and restrict people from trading whatsoever. Unless this employer can promise that they will meet all the expenses and the cost for that particular employee, and which is impossible. So we need to encourage people to be enterprising. Have a small garden at home. Enterprising is not just that you're going to sell. You can have a, a garden at home. You can have something small happening. You can have an airtel booth, like we are talking about it. Somebody is paying rental for an airtel booth at a mall for 15000 So the question is, why are they paying that? It's because they know something is able to give them something. So we cannot really advocate for co uh, restraint of trade in the contracts because it has potential to affect employees especially if the employees are unable to earn that kind of money i was discussing with a colleague who came from the usa yesterday actually uh he is in the office but is working remotely in zambia reporting in the us and for them the policy has changed it's about you being able to produce not being able to be in the office so what has this policy done to them it means that they are able to do he came to supervise his project in zambia so he's able to supervise the project that is constructing while it's producing for his employer in the U.S. So we need to accept that things have changed. Uh, otherwise, we'll still be stuck to the fact that, no, 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 you just expect a person to be working with you and producing for you. It's not possible. It's not possible. Actually, it's suicidal for an employee just to stay without thinking of creating a secondary income for themselves. It is suicide, though. I call it suicide, though, myself. What about those employees that are conducting their side hustle on the premises of their employer? Oh, we've, no. seen, <laughs> <laughs> we've seen people, obviously, <laughs> they've got clothes in the boot. At lunchtime, they open the boot. Others bring scones at work and they sell to their fellow employees. Others, um, you know, just sell different things, but they sell them at the work premises. Okay. What, do you, what do you make of that? I, I always say, do not bring a shop in a shop. Okay. Do not, you know what I mean by do not bring a shop in a shop is remember when you go to work at an employer, that's a workplace, you are producing from that side. Yeah. So if you bring in as well a smaller business to produce in the same place, you are competing. I remember telling you to say how will somebody account for the time that they will go to open their car? so that they will sell their clothes in there? How will they account for the time that they will be uh, collecting the money? All that is time that they can never account for. Unless they have got a person that comes in to sell it for them. But we shouldn't advocate for situations where employees bring their merchandise in the workplace. Because there's potential. Okay, let's assume I'm at this hotel here. Then an employee is, is a baker. Then they start bringing their cakes from home to come and sell to the workers. They are denying the employers a chance to earn an income. So most of these businesses, you find that it's not that they're not making money. 
employees are denying the owners of those businesses money because they are bringing merchandise to sell on the premises of employers when they're not paying rentals. Yet employers are still paying rentals for them and still paying a salary to them. So we've got to be fair as employees to some extent. I've always talked about people that are working for government, yeah. civil servants, um, and those that work in parastatals, which basically may, you know, fairly is the same thing. Yeah. That they have seemingly a lot of time. That's not true. I, I, I do not agree that those people have a lot of time. It's not that, it's just the fact that they're not making themselves productive. It's not that they have enough time. They have time, and I'll, t I'll give you an example. <laughs> a teacher <laughs> has a class from maybe in a day, maybe you have two periods. Yeah. You get the point, eh? Yeah. You cannot compare that person to someone who works in a bank or who works in an audit firm or who works in a, like in a, a, a cashier, for example, in pick and pay. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. The level of busy is different. Uh, that, uh, and then the civil servant can get six months. What do you call it? What leave is that? I don't know if it's unpaid leave the, or sabbatical leave no, or something. No, it's, it's paid leave. It's paid leave. It's called, um, is it holiday? No, not holiday something. It's called uh, vacation, vacation leave or something leave. like uh, that. Okay? Uh, in private sector, Which we don't, don't have in that. private sector. Yeah. You get a point. That's yeah. what I'm saying. So they have more time. You and me can run the same side hustle. But mine will be doing very well because, let's say, I'm a civil servant. Yeah. Okay? I don't work on weekends, for example. Yeah. That may not be the case in the private yeah. sector. So you, you get where I'm coming from. Okay, right? I hear so what you mean. So for me in government, a holiday is a holiday. Yeah. If they declare tomorrow is a holiday, it's a holiday. For you, they'll declare a holiday, but, but your you boss will say it's not a holiday. You, you, you see what, what so now, from? that is actually what I can now challenge you. That's what has made us in the private sectors to be more productive, even in our personal lives. If you see, uh, most, uh, with all the due respect, it's not everybody. With all, uh, most civil servants, because of that, they think they have a lot of time and they can work at their own pace. Mostly, even if they are doing their businesses, their businesses may not be as aggressive as somebody who's in the private sector. I'll tell you one thing that I've benefited working in private sector, especially in auditing firms, is knowing how to manage time. If I've got time, I think you saw how we agreed that let's have a podcast at 06 hours. Why? Because I knew at 8 hours I needed to be in the office and be able to, uh, to produce. But if I was working in the civil service, maybe I could have said let's even meet at 11 hours. We do not have value for time there. But you and I agreed to meet at 6.40, which is very unusual for somebody in the civil service. But this is why I would say I don't agree that they have a lot of time on their end. Maybe it's how are they using that time? Are they using it productively? That could be the question for another day. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so the point I was trying to bring across <laughs> is because they, they seem to have this... Okay, maybe let's, let, let's not say they have a lot of time. Yeah. Let's say they seem to... Maybe they have some flexibility. More flexi flexible. Uh, yes. That okay? I agree. That they I seem agree. to be more flexible. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, for some in the civil service, the, the pay that they get may not be as hefty as that in the private sector. Private sector. So someone in the private sector can have the luxury of saying, ah, side hustle is not for me. Yeah. But to find some civil servants, let's say, okay, you get paid 8,000 kwacha, okay? Because last time someone said 3,400 kwacha, there was a whole, you know, on social media. Yeah, so yeah. Let's, 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 let's use 8,000. 8, but kwacha. which is not even very true because an average Zambian is netting around the same three to five. That's where the majority of people are, are yeah. actually. Yeah. So I'm saying, that's, that's what I'm saying, let's be kind with the numbers. Okay, let's we, say 8,000 kwacha. We can even go okay. to 10,000. If you let's just want 10, to 10,000 kwacha, kind. okay, okay. <laughs> 10,000 kwacha, yeah. you're the head of the house, yeah. okay? So your rent, let's say, is 3,000 kwacha. Yeah. You've got 7,000 kwacha remaining. Let's say the transport cost to and fro work, for example, is 2,000 kwacha. You've got 5,000 kwacha remaining. Yeah. And you've got three children yeah. who also have to go to school. And they all have school fees. And they other costs. You've got weekend. You want to entertain yourself. You want yeah. to have a good time with your friends. You have, I don't know, some other commitments. You've got bills. You've got Zesco. You've got water. You've got... Before you even do anything, the and money way, is gone. You want to you, you just want to build. Yeah. The money is gone. Your option is let me go and get a loan. Yeah. But now let's now speak into what value the side hustle will bring. Yeah. And why I'm saying that is because I want us to establish that it is not an option. 
True. I feel like a side hustle is not an option. No. It's yeah. not like, ah, maybe I'll think about it. You no, know? No. no, no, no. And that's what I'm saying for most people. And and you see, we've worked with the 10,000 kwacha. Yeah. And you say the average, you are in HR, you say the average is three to 5,000 yeah. kwacha. So now if we said someone gets 5,000 kwacha and their rent is two five, half is gone. Yeah. And we've got three kids and let's not even depress ourselves with the numbers. Yeah. Okay. What kind of attitude should someone who has a low income have when it comes to side hustles? What kind of attitude should they have? I, I, I love one song by uh, King's uh, Malembe Malembe. The guy says, uh, it's not a song. It's actually he's saying, one of these things he says, he loves to say, you cannot be sitting on a nail and continue sitting on it and behave as if things are okay, right? You cannot be in a low-end position and still pretend things are okay. That is the beginning to this conversation. Like you have said, having an extra source of income is not an option at this stage. We all need to encourage individuals to find ways and means in which they can grow their streams of what? Income. I've met a, a lot of friends who are in the financial sector giving very good presentation and the likes. One thing that you find in my book that I've taught people, I say I'm not a financial expert, but one thing that I can tell you is you cannot continue cutting costs without increasing your sources of income. The problem is not actually you cutting the cost. The problem is that you are relying on one source of income. And that's why your question is, should a person still be stale or should they still be comfortable saying, oh, it's okay. My employer said I can't do business. Oh, no, it's okay. Maybe I'll wait for a 10% salary adjustment. No, 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 it's not okay. We need to be aggressive. And, and I've seen the, the, the wind on social media, which is taking place. I'm very positive that the next 5, 10 years, we're going to have a very different Zambia because every person is talking about doing something extra. So if we can actualize these promises we are making to ourselves and go and implement them, all of us will be in a better position. We, if we've established the fact that nobody can survive on one single source of income, even the people with higher brackets, okay? You still need to... I, I don't know any rich person who only has one business. I know people like Dangote, they've been in cement, they've been in salt, they have been in oil, they've been in different industries. Why are they doing that? Then why are you and I, why are we still maintaining one source of income? If even locally you went to people like Stephen Mulenga Mikaliri, he's got hotels, he's got shops, he's got, now he's doing butcheries. So now, why is he growing his streams of income? Because he knows that one source of income can give you uh, 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 shocks like what happened in the, what, what do we call the the, the why we come from the, the COVID. COVID the COVID COVID showed us that if you only relied on one business and that business went down that was the end of you so now for somebody who's working let's take that salary as a seed and I think this has been preached use that seed to grow it somewhere where it grows use that money to grow it in somewhere at least the minimum one person should have is two sources of income. That's why others have done one flat or two flats or one shop, two shops. At least there should be something. They will be able to now cater for the school fees for the children, for you to take uh, your wife to a better saloon, for you to take your wife, buy them something, you'll be able to. But with one source of income, your options and your choices are very low actually you won't have any option you only life will only be giving you what it has given you what about those people who don't have a side hustle but they're just living on debt you borrow you uh, month end you pay i, I think that's borrow. why they need to read now my book become unstoppable <laughs> because uh, uh unfortunately uh, i've always avoided to talk about debt for one simple reason the nature of the job that i do I come across a lot of uh, names of people. Then also on the other side, I've been doing uh, some businesses where I'm exposed to names of people that come to borrow and other things. So whenever I want to share a topic around debt, I'm very conscious because some people, even if I was speaking broadly, they may think about I'm talking about their situation. Debt in this country has reached a level where you cannot breathe. 
almost everybody is owing somebody. I went to a function where I asked in the room if there was anybody who was not owing somebody. There was only one person who was able to raise their hand out of 200 people in that room. And I can tell you that this is what is happening. Everybody is owing somebody. And now you cannot solve debt by borrowing more. Most people will come and get money from you to pay Yangeni. They get from Yangeni to pay Jack. They get from Jack to pay. So it's just a cycle. All they are doing is managing. Okay? And where they are right now, they cannot even see themselves to live without debt, unfortunately. So, so it's, it's a bigger conversation, but I've covered a chapter two, chapter three in my book as spoken about debt. How we can live a life free of debt. And the effects which debt has on your productivity. You know, if you are highly indebted, at the office you'll be very unproductive, <laughs> okay? At home you'll be very unproductive. Even when people just want to make jokes in society you, about things, you think these jokes are about you. <laughs> a, a person with debt can never stand freely. I say the quickest way in which you can actually lose your freedom is borrowing from somebody. Because you will never stand against that person. Because they will just be telling you, can't punch you. So, so debt is something that we quickly have to look at at individual level before, before you, you, you get stuck in it. Unfortunately, some people are already stuck in it. And the options which I have are very, very, very low. The only option is to increase the source of income. Maybe that's the only way you can come out of debt. All right, let's transition now into the conversation around um, the book Become Unstoppable. Yeah. Um, when you talk about unstoppable, in what context are you looking at being unstoppable? Okay, uh, I, I like one thing that uh, you've seen a lot of books on the market, especially Zambian literature. Actually, there are a lot of Zambian authors, if you didn't know. We've got a lot of them in Zambia. But there's something that is very unique uh, in this book. We're calling it Become Unstoppable. The 50 Magic Lessons to living or maximizing your potential. Right. Start with the cover page. If you look at the cover page, something very uh, funny is on that cover page. You see those who have a background of chess, the pawn, the queen, and the king, those pieces are well understood. So if you see at the front of my book, the pawn is viewing itself as a king. And in the game of chess, this is something impossible because the pawn can never become a what? A king. And this is what society has given us. Just because you are coming from Mutendere, you are coming from Chaisa, you are coming from Isoka, you are coming from Vubwe, society will tell you that the odds for you to succeed are very low. Unless you are the backup. That's why they say, uh, who is backing you have? But me, I'm saying, you can become unstoppable even if where you are coming from does not show or prove that there's some hope. You need to believe in yourself. That is why I'm calling Become Unstoppable because do not listen from what people are telling you that you, what you can't be. Because if I asked you, Sui, I remember the other time you did say you had a privilege to go to a private school, but some of us never went to a private school, right? So if we said, because I never went to private school, I could not write a book, then I'll be viewing myself as a pawn that will always remain a pawn. But you have to be unstoppable because life, just because you are born in soccer does not mean you are supposed to die in soccer. Is it one of those motivational books that just tell you you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, and ignore the reality of, okay, it's actually hard out there? You know the person that is talking, uh, some people have already given me that. No, no, we have seen a lot of motivational books and other things. My book is not a motivational book. I would like to quote the words that Dr. Cholwe, uh, Cholwe said when he read this book. He said, this is not a motivational book. This is a mentorship manual. Okay? Why? Because the book has been split into five chapters. And each chapter covers a different theme. I've talked about finances. I've talked about personal development. I've talked about the relationships at work. And I've talked about the relationship in society and how you can just make an impact. Uh, you know, I'm coming from a background of nature. I've worked in human resources in the last 12, 15 years. So what I've written in this book is not just something to inspire somebody. It's the steps that I've, I've applied myself and I feel somebody can apply them to change 
their life. Remember, uh, Swilanji, if your personal uh, development, if you do not give chance to yourself to develop, you cannot develop others. If I ask somebody to say this year we are in September and the year is coming to an end, okay, how many trainings have you budgeted for yourself? Or how many workshops have you attended? Apart from those which your employer has given you, you notice that most of us have got nothing on our budgets to train ourselves. But my book challenges you to say, before the employer, there is you. The employer only comes to you out of the knowledge that you have. Remember ZNBC came to you after you told them, I've gone to school and I've done these things. That's when they came to you. So personal development becomes a critical component in every person's life. And this is the introduction in the book that you've got to develop yourself before any employer comes to you. And most people will say, no, no, no. My employer is not doing anything for me. No, this my uncle is not doing for me. No, no, no. It's not about those people. Life is about yourself. So my book challenges you that you are on your own. Develop yourself first before other people can admire you. Not to preempt the book, what is the number one most important lesson in the book? Ah, that will be a challenge for me. <laughs> if you told you me number one. No, I've, <laughs> I've been reading that book every day. I can't pinpoint one because each lesson that is in that book is so unique. Even myself, remember this has taken me almost five years to compile it. So it's not a one month or one year thing. Even when I read it today, I keep asking myself, Oh, Yangeni, you mean you're the one who wrote this? There's something that happened. Uh, a young lady called me. She was called for, a, for an interview, right? And uh, uh, when she told me the organization, and I've interviewed this person before, I felt like she's not ready to take up this role because what she's doing and the, the profile of that uh, organization was so big. But when I opened my book, the book told me that become unstoppable. Do not limit yourself before you give yourself a chance to go for an interview. Then I called her back. I said, you know what? Go for it. Go and get this interview because you are unstoppable. So this book is even able to challenge myself because sometimes you feel like I can't do this. But the book reminds me, say, no, no, you are unstoppable. You can do it. I'll tell you something funny. Uh, you know, initially the, the launch was supposed to be on the 24th. Yeah, and you remember we moved the dates to the 1st of October. We were having a challenge to put all the uh, speakers on the same day. So when I was speaking to my assistant, I was, I was a bit uncomfortable. We said, I call this speaker. They're saying, no, they're flying out of the country. I call this speaker. Then they, my, my, my assistant told me, your book tells you that you are unstoppable. You wrote the book not with the speakers, not with the host, you wrote it alone. So you should be able to still go ahead and launch the book, even if one speaker will not be available. So the book, my own book, is also able to challenge me, even when I feel like I want to give up, but it tells me you are unstoppable. Keep going. <laughs> I look forward to the book, which is yeah. launching on the... 1st of, of October, which October. is just uh, next Saturday, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we look forward to, to, to the launch of the book. And uh, obviously, after launch, it obviously will be available to the general public. It will be very available. And right now, as we speak, it's already live on Amazon. You should be able to able to view it and be able to get yourself a soft copy on there. And the hard copy will be going for 250 uh, kwacha. But coming to the function, we're trying to restrict the function. We're putting it for 350. And the function will be at uh, Mulungushi uh, International Conference, the new KK Wing which is uh, uh, one of the premier places we have in Zambia. And we'll, we, we're looking forward to an exciting day. Interesting. As we come to an end, what would you say are your top five um, pieces of advice that you'd like to give to someone watching the podcast at the moment? Okay. One, this my father taught me, nobody owes you a single thing in life. Everything that you want, you're supposed to fight for them. Yeah? Number two, you're going to be patient with yourself. There's a story of the bamboo tree. I know you know about yeah. it, how it grows in. Most of us want to develop within a day or two. There's a lot of patience that is required for you to grow in life. Number three, you need to be exceptional in everything that you're doing. Okay? Exceptional performer never lacks. The odds may be against you, but if you are an exceptional performer, you will never lack a single thing. 
Number four, this is my favorite quotation. A charcoal burner's child will one day wear a white shirt. Just because you were born from a charcoal burner does not mean you be you die as a charcoal burner's child. You can change the narratives of society. Then number five, stand out, live a little. Do not always close yourself up. You know, I've met people that have made so much money, but they're still planning, no, I'm going to do this tomorrow. I'm going to travel tomorrow. No, I'll try it today. No, you don't. Don't live as if you've got thousand lives ahead. You only have one life. Live it nice. Live it today. Just enjoy yourself. But don't be careless. <laughs> Thank you very much for the time. Um, you have to go for work now. Are you sure? After eight. Uh, otherwise, the insights for me, like, like a very good, I look forward to reading the book. I know you, you gave me a soft copy of the book, but I actually want to have the hard copy of the book. Um, and then obviously as, as I get to read, as I get to, you know, acclimatize myself with the content, we'll obviously be having discussions or like, you know, I saw that and Absolutely. I read that and, you know, some clarification also. And basically, I feel like in Zambia we have to, I know the reading culture has improved, but there's more that we can that do. Can do yeah. We need more book clubs, we need more, you know, conversations, critiquing the book and, yeah. you know, th and we don't get that. I don't yeah, know if true. you writers get that kind of feedback. No, no, we, 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 we don't. But I'll, I'll tell you one thing on the same. There's been this thing that in Zambia the, the reading culture is not good so how are you even going to sell the book <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll tell you one thing in my book there's a story of two sales people who were sent to a place where their product was not there so one of them after a week the guy came back and told his boss i can't sell in this place because nobody knows about our product then the other guy asked the boss to say can i stay a little longer because in this place there's nobody who has ever heard about our product so for him he felt this was an opportunity for him to create a new business it is in the same vein that i've inspired myself to say because everybody keeps talking about it that in zambia the reading culture is not strong for me i see it as an opportunity using my book to inspire people to read even those that have not finished the book this is a book that they'll finish Ask me why. Why? It's very simple to read. Because I know that people struggle to read books. I've put it in bullet forms, which will be easier if on a particular morning you just want to read four points. You'll be able to read four points and those four points will not leave you the same. I challenge you, if you read this book, finish it and nothing changes you. Come back to me, I'll be able to refund you your money. Because I don't want you to hold something that you don't value. That's how much I believe in this content that I've put in this book. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sue <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's where our podcast for today ends. We're talking to Mr. Yangene Chandela as an HR expert. He's an author of the book, Become Unstoppable. You don't have it yet, but obviously next time we'll obviously make it available for you. And the launch of the book will be on the 1st of October, which is this Saturday. Thank you so much for being a part of the podcast. Uh, like, subscribe, share, tell a friend about it. And I hope that you will find your true side hustle and thrive in it. Enjoy the rest of your day.